Dr. Savicki. Thanks, Dr. Philippi. Uh, I'm not sure I get the credit, but thanks <laughs> anyway. So my name is Kristen Savicki. I'm with the Office of Behavioral Health. Welcome to all of you on behalf of the Office of Behavioral Health. Um, we've been working on this project for a couple of years now with our great partners at the Center for Evidence to Practice, really working on helping providers who serve Medicaid-insured kids to access really high-quality training in evidence-based models for kids. So providers, who a lot of you are on the phone right now, um, have jumped in and we're really excited about how many folks have been um, motivated to learn and use these really high quality models to serve our most vulnerable kids. So now we wanna help you sustain this. We know that paying for the training is not enough. We know that delivering these high quality services is hard work and it's expensive and it comes with additional costs to you in the form of reduced caseloads and additional supervision et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you can go into lots of details uh, yourselves about what this, what this takes to make this work. And for agencies, we also know that it's tough to hang on to highly qualified, well-trained staff. We know that's always difficult and it's even more so now. So this is our, the, the RFA that, that we're talking about today is, is our initial attempt to, to give you providers an additional tool to sustain these services uh, through some financial support to help you cross the finish line, to get those national certifications, to fully integrate these services into your larger agency, into your EHRs, and retain your staff who are trained and, and are providing really high quality care to kids. So we just wanna say we value your work and we really wanna help you keep it going. Uh, and with that, I'll stop talking and turn it back over to um, the center staff who are really running this show for us. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce Ronnie Rubens, um, uh, who has been, uh, working with us on this project, and she's going to review the um, uh, the the deliverables and the overview of this project. Um, Ronnie, hi everyone. Um, I'm I'm coming to you from Philadelphia, so I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say good morning or afternoon because I think we're split between those right now. Um, but uh, let me go ahead and get started. Um, we have Lisa here who's helping us run the, the video and tech. So Lisa, will you go ahead and do the next slide for me? That's great. Um, just to give you a, a heads up about what's happening here today, obviously you've already gotten some introductions. We wanna go over this funding opportunity, give you some of the background that dro drove us here, um, cover some of the key funding requirements um, and key elements of this opportunity, some of the expectations if you're accepted through this RFA and the timeline and details for submission. And then we really do hope to um, switch over to a Q&A uh, and give you some time to ask questions. Um, and Sarah, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the uh, opportunity is to put your questions into the chat um, if you have them as we're speaking. And then Lisa will um, help us uh, review the answers, uh, discuss those questions and answers toward the end of the meeting. Um, this is being recorded, um, so it will be available to you all later on, and we will um, also be synthesizing answers, and in particular, if there are any questions we can't answer for you here and now, uh, right away, uh, we'll be making sure we get those answers out through um, a uh, FAQ, if you're going to ask questions page, that will be posted as well. Um, can we do the next slide? Uh, so we already got our welcome from Dr. Savicki, but we wanted to make sure you were aware of some of the other key folks who are part of this team. Um, I'm on the bottom there. My name is Ronnie Rubin, and I'm a consultant that's been working on this project. Um, Dr. Philippi uh, kicked us off, and Sarah, will you make sure everybody knows who you are? Um, and I see Lisa is on. If she can just give a wave, she's going to be helping uh, handle the question and answer and is the new uh, program administrator for the evidence-based practice uh, part of the center. Um, why don't I jump into the next part of the slide where we um, get into sort of the meat of the things and we'll come back um, and hopefully everybody Zoom will be working better afterwards. Um, so just a quick overview. You all are here. Hopefully that means that you've seen that this RFA was posted. Um, and I do hope that you've had a chance to review some of the details already, uh, but I will try to highlight them for you. All of this information that I'll be presenting today is in quite a bit of detail in the RFA um, and in um, the supporting materials that are going to come with it as well. 
Um, but the key idea here is, as Dr. Sabicki mentioned, is that our, we want to be supporting the providers who are implementing evidence-based uh, programs for children and youth, in particular in outpatient settings. Um, and the idea is to offset some of the costs that we understand you all are incurring in the process of doing this. Um, the funding opportunity is for Medicaid practitioners and agencies, and it will range between $3,500 up to $40,000. And I know that's a big range. Um, so we'll go through the details of the funding amounts and how those will be calculated. Um, and then uh, we do want to really highlight how critical it is to use the Medicaid claims uh, tracking code. So that's a big part of this effort. And uh, it will require folks to make sure that they are working closely with their MCOs to be credentialed for those EVPs and then to work through the details of getting them into their uh, claims system. And the way that this funding is working is that it's being distributed through contracts with the Center for Evidence to Practice. So it's state funding that is supporting all of you in partnership with the Center for Evidence to Practice. Um, so I'm gonna dig into some of those details. Next slide, please. And where I really wanna start, and Dr. Sabicki started to bring this up, is that this is really in response to what we've heard from practitioners who are doing evidence-based practices nationally as well as in Louisiana. So my work is more around the country um, and I can say that it's quite consistent what we are seeing out there, which is that um, systems and practitioners really value evidence-based models. They see how effective and useful they are. They support the development, career development, the professional development of the workforce and um, they're incredibly effective tools in particular for issues like trauma. Um, where you have a lot of trauma-focused evidence-based models in your state. Um, and so the value is really there, but the reality of what it takes to do them is quite challenging. Uh, the center uh, has a study brief um, based on some of that national data, as well as conversations we had last spring with um, local practitioners and uh, agency leaders about what those challenges are. And what we understand now is that training is essential and the state has done an incredible job of offering support for training, uh, but it is not enough. Um, that there are additional costs outside of paying for those expert trainers um, that are quite significant, both the direct and indirect cost to implement and sustain the models. And what we heard in Louisiana in particular in outpatient therapy is that the rates are not adequate and that where that um, causes particular challenges in staff retention and retaining these very qualified skilled staff is um, essential for raising the quality of services for children and families throughout the state. And what we also recognize is that to sustain a practice like this, you really want it to become part of the absolute regular practice as usual operations of an organization. Um, that's what keeps it going is if it has that type of sustainability and it takes time and resources to fully integrate an EBP service, both on the clinical and on the operational billing side, staffing side of an organization. So this funding opportunity is in recognition of those challenges that we see both nationally and within Louisiana. Next slide, please. The other part of this is to recognize how critical it is to have the data. So we're gonna talk a lot about the not so glamorous side of doing mental health and behavioral health service, which is around billing and claims and credentialing with MCOs and those kinds of things, because at the end of the day, if we have the data that we need in the uh, Medicaid claims data around who is receiving an evidence-based practice, this information is very, very helpful for both advocating for con continued um, training support and, and support for those clinicians it's helpful for identifying where are we reaching the folks who need these services and where are we not reaching those children and families? Um, how do we continue to expand that footprint? So in all of those ways, EBP uh, in claims is gonna be one of the key um, deliverables for all of us of this project. And the truth is that those claims data, uh, the claim tracking codes have been available for quite some time. Again, the center did a brief in the spring that recognized that while those tracking codes were available through, um, through Medicaid and through the LDH uh, provider manual, they weren't often being used. And there may be a variety of reasons for why that's the case, knowledge and information about them. Um, 
making it to that point of actually achieving the qualification or certification in the EBP, or working through all the technical parts of putting it into billing and working with the credentialing departments in each of the MCOs to make sure those are in place. So we see this funding opportunity as a chance to both support the financial side of what it takes to do that work, as well as some technical assistance in supporting folks in making sure that they are able to get to um, that, that information and claims. Thank you, perfect timing. Um, so in terms of what we have included in this RFA, I wanna highlight just a few key um, requirements. So who is this funding for? It's for practitioners and uh, agencies that are contracted with Medicaid managed care organizations and are specifically delivering this list of EBPs, full on list of acronyms there, but if you do it, you know which one is yours, um, in outpatient therapy by licensed mental health practitioners specifically. So it's to target that outpatient line of service. Um, the reason for that is these EBPs do fit appropriately within outpatient mental health, and um, that's where we've seen the greatest challenge with the rates, um, with paying for doing these services in outpatient therapy. Um, in terms of the funding timeline, it really limits this to practitioners and agencies that already have staff who are certified or qualified in these EBPs. And here I want to be really um, <clears throat> clear that I'm going to use the terms qualified and certified in the EBPs interchangeably. Um, I think we all understand certification is the idea that you've met a certain level of EVP training that usually is training plus consultation in some cases that may include an exam of some kind for the different models. Each model has their own version of what it means to be certified or qualified in that uh, EVP. They use different terms. It might be certified, trained, rostered. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to try to use the term EVP qualified to just uh, highlight that that's the most generic term. But what we've done is we've really tried to be very specific about what the requirements are for each EVP within a new resource that was developed. Uh, it's this excuse me, EBP qualification and billing guide. It is, uh, I think the link is about to come to you through the chat, um, and it's also available with the RFA on the center's website. What's in there is information about each of the EBPs, what the level of certification or qualification is that's required, links back to the training entities so that you can do some of your own research around that if you need to, or follow up directly with your EBP trainer if you need to, this information is also available to the MCOs so that everybody's talking the same language. Um, and then that guide also has information about the specific EBP tracking codes that need to be integrated into um, your billing and claims processes. The other part of this is that that information needs to be shared with the MCOs and you need to be credentialed in each EBP. Um, with the MCO. So in that guide, there are also resources uh, for reaching out to the MCOs and contact lists of folks there that uh, will partner with us in terms of um, making sure everybody has their qualifications are able to bill. Okay, so I think we're ready for the next slide. Um, here, I just wanted to walk through a bit about the funding amount. So again, this information is within the RFA, but we know it can be a bit confusing. Um, what the funding amounts are is between $3,500 up to $10,000 per outpatient therapy service location. If an agency has multiple locations and each of those locations is offering an EBP, they can submit an application for up to four locations for their agency. These funding amounts are available for each EBP that the practitioner is qualified in and delivering. Um, and it's tiered by the number of uh, qualified clinicians within an agency. So if you're a sole practitioner or if there's just one person at your agency doing the EBP, that funding amount is 3,500. Um, and then it jumps up if an agency has four or more clinicians doing that EBP, uh, the funding amount is 4,500. Then what we've done is offered a volume of claims additional or bonus amount. What this is, is an additional amount of money for um, agencies that are demonstrating through claims that three or more clients have received three or more EVP sessions within this contract funding, uh, this, uh, the, the time of this contract. And we'll get into the timeline for that. Um, so the 
initial $3,500 is if you are doing an EBP and just are, um, we just see evidence of it in claims with one or two sessions or one or two clients, but you haven't quite met that three clients with three or more EBP session amount. Um, but once you are able to achieve that three clients with three or more sessions, uh, the additional $3,000 is there. The reason for doing this type of uh, funding scheme, it's not the simplest, but it's because we do want to acknowledge and recognize that uh, provider agencies and, and practitioners are in different stages of achieving their EVP qualifications. So some folks are already qualified and just need to get their billing in order, and then we'll be able to show us that they're doing a volume of service, and we want to recognize that. For other folks, this funding opportunity is a chance to get, again, past that finish line of being certified, working out the details with MCOs for credentialing, and starting to bill. And so we wanted to make sure that we were offering um, funding depending on where you are in that stage of the process. Um, next slide, please. So what I did, we, we've done here, and again, this is in the RFA, if you want to look at it more closely, is just tried to offer a few examples to try to be a little bit more clear about what those funding opportunities are. So for example, if we have a solo practitioner who has achieved certification in TFCBT, and during the contract period um, through claims is demonstrating that they have seen three or more clients for three or more sessions each, they would receive the $3,500 plus an additional 3,000. Um, and that would be the funding amount that they would get at the end of this contract period. For uh, an agency, they may be in a situation where they have two practitioners uh, rostered in CPP and an additional two practitioners who've met the qualifications for EMDR. But during the contract period, they're doing a few sessions each. They have yet to achieve that three client, three session um, amount to receive the bonus. They would receive $8,000. And then in the third example, you may have an agency that has three practitioners in YPT, three practitioners doing another EVP, and achieved a volume of service for, let's say, YPT. In that case, if you want to check my math, you'll see it's more than the $10,000 amount, but they're achieving at that point the maximum uh, through this funding opportunity. Um, so we laid out these examples as a way for you to take a look at what the funding options may be for your organization. Um, and we're happy to walk through what that would be for your specific scenario, if um, that would be helpful um, via email or, or uh, as well. Um, next slide, please. So um, this funding opportunity is really targeted at achieving certification or qualification in EBPs in integrating the information into your claims um, those are going to be the deliverables that are really required for receiving the funding. But we wanted to be really clear that the intention behind this funding is around building capacity and sustainability for EBPs within your organization. So what those two things, uh, the certification or, or qualification, the EBPs and the billing reflect is really a commitment uh, uh, by your organization to be building your capacity and the volume of service you're delivering in a sustainable way for EVPs. So what we wanna highlight here is just some of the other parts that go with that. With a commitment to building and sustaining EVPs in your organization, um, we're really strongly encouraging agencies to think about what it takes to support those clinicians, to help them get through that certification process, to think about what it takes to support them in delivering a volume of service. What does that mean for your intake processes? How are you gonna make sure that they're seeing uh, folks who can most benefit from the EVP? And what do you do to retain those clinicians and, and supervisors? We strongly encourage agencies to think about how they direct some of these funds um, to the retention of those skilled clinicians um, in order to stay in the practice. We are asking agencies to really think about committing to using those EBP tracking codes. The ones that will get you this funding, you will obviously pay attention to, but it's really intended to help you change your operations so that you are able to continue to use those codes, to use those codes for new clinicians who might become um, eligible for them, uh, and to think about how we partner together in using that data uh, to support the expansion of EBPs throughout the state. 
Um, there will be an expectation to sh share de-identified data that's going to be necessary for the project deliverables. That's really about making sure that we are able to get um, the claims data in a timely way um, so that we can recognize that you delivered the EBP by a, um, a qualified clinician. And we see this uh, funding opportunity as a chance to really partner together in a new way with the Center for Evidence to practice around whatever supports you may need to be successful in achieving these deliverables and to be successful in, in sustaining the EVP long-term. So um, you will see in the RFA, there are opportunities to submit to us uh, where you might need more help or support in achieving deliverables. Please do take your time in looking at the resource that's available through the um, EVP qualification and billing guide. Um, through using the MCO contacts that we'll be able to share with you, but then also let us know what additional supports or technical assistance might be helpful in achieving um, uh, these deliverables because we do want folks to be successful. So these are some of the expectations that go along with that funding that will be available um, through this opportunity. Next slide, please. Please reintroduce yourself and then I'll hand it over to you to go over the timeline and some of the technical aspects of the RFA application. So the timeline is a rolling deadline. We are accepting applications now through our online form. It opened on October 28th. The applications uh, for this funding will be open until January 15th, 2022. We will notify everyone by February 1st. However, if you submit, and we do encourage you to submit your form, uh, your application early, uh, we will be contacting you within two to three weeks uh, to discuss next steps with the contracting process and, um, and uh, gathering your information to uh, uh, to send to the MCOs and, and to accomplish the deliverables in the contract. So all the contracts should be in place by March the 15th, 2022. Uh, the provider, those who are accepted, the applicants that are accepted for, for the project need to have all of their activities completed and invoiced by August the 1st, 2022. We will receive them before then, but that's the absolute deadline. And the distribution of funds will occur by September 30th, 2022. Next slide. So the, it's a very simple process, we hope. Um, it's basically entering your, um, if you're a sole practitioner or whether you're an, an agency organization, um, submitting the names of all of the practitioners that work with your agency. And we do want to uh, clarify that practitioners that are included in an agency application can only be included in one application overall. Um, I, and then um, we, we want you to list um, which evidence-based practices you are providing and delivering to children and youth and uh, list the locations because we're going to calculate, um, you know, by location, the funding amount. And, um, and we also would like to have your Medicaid information, who you're credentialed with of the five MCOs, uh, which, um, what is your NPI, how, how are you filing claims, whether you're already using the tracking codes. Um, information is important for us to move forward. And um, uh, let's see, can you put the, oh, good. Uh, Lisa has put the, the form, the online form into the chat box. And uh, so I would just suggest that uh, you gather your information of your, you know, contacts and uh, location addresses, your emails, your NPI numbers, Etc. And it should be a pretty quick process to fill out the application if you have all of that gathered. Um, just a logistics um, with the app. you can navigate between the nav the the different pages. Some of the page. 
and you can and nothing is going to be submitted until uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a message that my internet is unstable. Uh, but so let me know if, if something happens and, and you can't hear me. So the um, nothing is going to be submitted to us until you actually uh, click the submission button at the end of the form. One other piece to the, to the form is that we are learning that practitioners may be uh, trained and qualified in more than two evidence-based practices. And we originally only had enough room uh, to list two for each practitioner. We're going to update the form, but in the meantime, if you'd like to add uh, additional evidence-based practices that you qualify for, you may do that in the comments section at the end of the form. Um, so uh, we will guide you with the process uh, for submitting invoices. Uh, we will provide you with a template on what information we require uh, to be submitted and would ask you to submit those invoices to the center's email address. Are there any questions about the submission, the application submission process? Why don't we go, we have the next slide, I think, just as a, a reminder um, of where you can find all the resources so we can put that up. And then as um, Sarah mentioned, if you have specific questions about the application process, um, please do put those in the chat as well. Um, and then I don't know if, are we ready to open it up for question and answer now? I believe so. And uh, Lisa has, has some questions that she's been tracking in the chat box. Yeah, so our first question was early on, um, what about social determinants of mental health oh, services? Sorry. Who is funding support services? It was early on in the chat. And if whoever asked that question, um, Mr. Bill K, I <laughs> don't wanna mispronounce, if you wanna get off mute and further explain your question, uh, you're welcome to. I'd also be happy to jump in and, and say that it's a fantastic question that we could talk about all day long. Um, it's not actually in the scope of this particular funding opportunity. Um, I mean, I think that, I think what, um, what the questioner is pointing to is that there's a lot of things that impact the wellness and, and mental health of, of kids. And it's not all therapy, um, which is a really important point that we all need to um, be paying attention to across all of our systems. Um, this particular funding opportunity, however, is very specific to therapy and making sure that once kids get to the point of needing this kind of therapy, that we make sure that we have really high quality uh, therapy available for them. So it's a great question and feel free to reach out to me separately for a um, uh, larger discussion, which is a great discussion to have, you know, today and every day. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that. Our next question, which was privately chatted, are the qualifications for only our clinical staff or PLPC and or LMSWs? Again, Dr. Sabiga, do you want to um, get into that? What I will say is that this is within the scope of outpatient therapy by a licensed um, practitioner, which is very specific line of service within the LDH manual. Um, some of the EDPs have very consistent um, staffing requirements that go with that. Some might be open to other folks who may not be licensed in another context, but that's specifically who this funding opportunity is for and this um, uh, and, and that information is available in the LDH manual and also in our guide, it points to that as well. Um, Dr. Savicki, did you wanna add? Yeah, again, great question. And, and we love it when provisionally licensed folks are jumping in on getting trained in EVPs early in their, early in their careers. It's a, it's a fantastic time to be learning um, you know, evidence-based practices. 
Um, and if those folks are going to, you know, become licensed or on the way to become licensed, and if they do get nationally, you know, certified, then they can meet these, um, these requirements. However, at this time, the ability to actually bill for outpatient therapy by licensed practitioners um, in the Medicaid system is limited to folks who are fully licensed. So that's going to be LCSWs, LMFTs. Um, so this, this funding opportunity is really targeted to folks who are kind of already at that mark of, or at least, or will get there before August um, in terms of being fully licensed. Okay, great. Thank you. I went ahead and put that LDH Behavioral Health Services Provider manual link in the chat for those uh, that would like to reference it. Uh, great. Thank you for that. Our next question is, um, should we only submit these applications if we are already certified in either of these EVPs? So the reality is if you have not yet been trained in an EVP, there isn't enough time between now and August when the deliverables are due. Um, this opportunity is available to folks who are already certified, um, or who are well on their way towards certification and will get towards certification and be able to demonstrate that they are using the tracking code before the end of the funding period, which is um, in August. So um, that timeline does give time for folks who have not yet been certified. An example would be TFCBT, maybe they were completed all of the training requirements, they've completed all the consultation requirements, but there's also an application and an exam that needs to go in there. There's enough time to complete the application and exam and perhaps see one or two clients with your billing code. Um, and so that would be a good opportunity to say, hey, let me get that bit of work done uh, with this funding opportunity and get past that, um, that, that threshold. So it is for folks who are on their way to certification or currently certified. Awesome. Okay. Um, I believe our last question we have received, if there's any more, feel free to either jump off mute or put it directly in the chat. But our last question we have is, if I've already been providing EBPs, is retroactive billing slash claims data used to determine the funding amount for a provider? No. <laughs> the answer to that is no. The billing period that we will be using is within the contract period. So um, Lisa, would you be able to go back to the timeline um, slide? Um, we mm -hmm. can put that up again. So we will be looking at claims information during the contract period. So um, from when the point of notification, so February 1st, I believe would be the start date. Um, and it may be a little bit off with that, but it will go from your contract period all the way through August 1st. So though that is the time frame that we will look at claims for for this funding opportunity. For those of you who've already been doing this and already have claims prior to this period, thank you. Um, first of all, for having done that, for having um, achieved your certification and worked out those billing codes. We will not go back to give you credit, but we hope you will be able to achieve um, some of those uh, additional volume funding amounts um, in recognition of the work that you're already doing. And then Lisa, I don't know if there were more questions coming up in the chat as well. Did you see any of those? Yes, I've been monitoring that. We actually got okay. one more. Um, okay. Can you explain if hourly billing rates will be increased based on adding the EBP codes? So at this time, no. So what's happening is there is not an increase in the hourly rate. It is something that other systems have done. It's something that this system may be looking at in the future. But at this point in time, the hourly billing codes um, or the hourly rate remains the same. Um, and that the EBP tracking code is like an information code. It's something that allows us to understand that this session was delivered differently, but the rate itself, at least at the state level, the rate itself is not different. Um, but <laughs> that is in consideration. 
um, the importance of figuring out how to continually support EBP providers is there. This funding opportunity in some ways is a workaround of that. The reality is those rates take longer to change and may not change at this time, but we heard loud and clear and the state recognized that many providers were saying uh, that doing this work on the current rates and achieving all of these extra hurdles uh, was not feasible with the current rates they had. And so we're, again, we're hoping that this is an offset to the time and energy and cost that goes into doing this work. It is not the change in rate that some folks may be looking for at this point in time. Um, Dr. Savicki, did you wanna add anything more? No, that's a perfect summary. Um, yeah, we know that we, we would love to be able to increase the rate, the hourly rates, we haven't been able to do it. And so as Dr. Rubin says, this is, in a lot of ways, our attempt to find a different way to offset costs that providers are, are um, undertaking in order to deliver these services. I have a question. Um, I am a um, newly individual uh, behavioral provider, right? And I just got trained in trauma-focused CBT and I hope to begin implementing that in the very near future. So am I correct in understanding that if I begin implement, implementing these services prior to January 15th, I can apply for this? Is that? So congratulations on finishing your training. Um, we encourage you to start practicing and starting to build your caseload as soon as possible. Um, I'm not clear from your information if you just finished the training and consultation or if you've gone through the full certification process, because after training and consultation, there's also certification. If Only, you're the not training. Okay. Only the training. So once you get through the training and the supervised consultation, then there's the next step of getting fully certified. All of that information is in the guide that we provided, and your trainers are a wonderful resource as well for supporting you in getting to that point. Um, I cannot say for sure what your timeline will be um, in terms of achieving that by this August 1st deadline. Maybe take a little time with the RFA and looking at the requirements and seeing if they'll line up. And if it looks like you can achieve those um, uh, requirements by August 1st, then you're encouraged to apply. But please, no one should see this as a um, reason not to be doing the service um, and, and uh, working toward using the billing codes, even if the timeline doesn't look, line up precisely for your situation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, and received another question. Um, is there a plan to continue the additional funding past the September 2022 date? Uh, thank you, Mr. Farmer, with a great question. Um, and just to be transparent, we're, we're doing what we can right now with, with, the, with the money that we have right now. Um, we certainly have, you know, this is, this is funding that's been allocated for this purpose. It has a particular time frame in terms of how we're able to, how and when we need to use the allocated funding. So this is sort of the project we've built based on what we have available. Um, we absolutely have internal discussions uh, going on at LDH about other ways we can continue this or similar work in the future. I don't have anything I can share at this time, but we're certainly looking at it and we would love to be able to continue this if we can. Thank you. We're going to do it regardless. I was just curious. Oh, it's a great question. It's my question too. And, and I will flag for you all that um, the billing codes have been there um, and the, the requirements have been there. None of this has changed those. This is just sort of amplifying and putting in front of everybody the details of how to use those tracking codes and what the requirements, the qualification requirements are for those tracking codes. And I would encourage everybody to see that this is a um, chance to shine a light on that, to work together, to deal with some of the technical problems in getting there. But in the long term, having those tracking codes set and part of your organizational strategy will be extremely beneficial for any funding opportunity that comes down the pike. So no matter what, it's going to be important for the state to be in Medicaid to be able to see that you are qualified, your staff is qualified in, and able to bill to these codes in order to achieve 
funding in the future. So please do see this as an opportunity to sort of focus your attention there. Um, even if the funding strategy changes, the billing codes and the certification will be critical going forward. And we received another question. Um, somebody is completing the application as they speak, which is great. And uh, their providers are trained in three EVPs, um, but it looks like the application only allows to list two EVPs per provider. Um, and I believe I think I can answer that one myself. You can go ahead at the end of the application in the comments and go ahead and list uh, the additional EVPs. We will be making a slight change to the um, form and allow options, for at least three options, if not more. But in the short term, you can insert it in the comment section, which is the very last uh, question of the application. And, and I think I, oh, I saw a question very early on, I think right at the beginning, which was, um, it, do we submit the RFA to become trained in these EVPs? Um, so just to flag for you all, this is a very specific RFA, quite different than some of the ones that have been issued um, previously for the Center to Evidence, from the Center to Evidence for Evidence to Practice. Um, many of these EVPs, the training is offered through the center. We encourage you to keep an eye on the website, be on their email list, and look for those training opportunities. This RFA is not a training opportunity. This is really capturing the community that is already trained or well on their way to becoming certified. Um, so I just wanted to flag that. I don't know if anybody had more information they needed on that question. And uh, thank you, Ms. Linda Lopez for the comment. She said, thank you for providing tracking codes. She's currently using YPT and EMDR in her practice, but never had the tracking codes. So she appreciates that. And then um, uh, we have another question. Um, are you aware of any other states providing enhanced funding for EVPs like this project? Thank you for asking that question. That was actually where we started a lot of this work. So I um, just wanna recognize that um, OBH and the Center for Evidence to Practice um, did a lot in laying the groundwork for this uh, effort here. Um, it started with a scan of other systems and states to look at what they're doing. Um, we have some of that information available on the Center for Evidence to Practice website, um, but the short answer is there are a few systems that are looking at ways to either do enhanced rates at the state level. Um, some managed care organizations have directly um, set up enhanced rates within their plans. Um, and so that is sometimes done and negotiated between providers and their managed care organizations for EVPs. Um, and then other systems have done things like this, where they look at ways to provide financial support and bonuses to agencies that are achieving some level of um, organizational support and sustainability for EVPs. So we see a range of strategies, some more grants-based like this one is, and some more rates-based um, with states and managed care organizations. And we continue to track what other systems are doing to make sure that uh, we're finding ways to support these EVPs. Thank you. Um, another question is, is there, if there is not enough money to fully fund this project, how will decisions be made or prioritized? So I'll give a brief version of that and we'll see if we need to add any answers. I, we will be tracking. So one thing is we anticipated a number of the number of applicants based on incredible amounts of work that the center has done to try to be aware of who is certified or working towards certification in the state. Um, so we have some sense of how to anticipate the funding and this funding amount should be available. Um, if our projections are correct, um, for everybody who we were aware of. So we do not think of this as a competitive funding where only a certain number. Now, we will be tracking very closely the number of applications that come in. Obviously, those applications will be due um, this winter and the full funding amount will go out in August. So I assume we will have a way to notify providers if anything needs to change in the funding amount. 
but our anticipation is that the funding is available for the full number of potential applicants that we're aware of. Um, I don't know, Dr. Savicki, if you had anything to add on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the amount of money allocated for this is really based on um, a lot of very, you know, um, well thought out projections about the provider pool who will be eligible for the funding. So we're, we're not anticipating a problem. But again, um, as Dr. Rubin notes, you know, we'll, we'll know by, you know, uh, January 15th, we'll have a good um, sense of who's applying and, and, um, and if there's any, if we're going to over, you know, go over and above our, um, our projections. Um, that's a good problem to have, um, and we'll, we'll kind of um, be able to revisit this then, but we're not anticipating a problem. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, it, somebody is wondering why Magellan, apologies if I mispronounced it, is not considered in the claims data since most of their clients benefit from EP. Uh, to be honest, we should add them. Um, I, I mean, I think we on a, we often um, focus efforts on um, ensuring adequate provider networks within the MCOs because they have a much larger um, volume of membership, um, whereas Magellan's uh, members are, um, I believe we're at 2,500 um, CSOC kids. And, and CSOC also as a program is for kids five and up. Some of the EVPs that, that we've worked on most intensively have been for younger kids. Um, so their membership is less, um, are, are utilizing these less, but at the same time, um, that's actually a great point. We should probably uh, note them on the, on the application as well. And feel free to use, there is an extra box at the bottom for additional information that needs to be provided. If you are a practitioner who's offering the service through Magellan and using your billing that way and and sort of want to flag for us that that's a big omission for who your client base is, please make sure you make note of that. Um, and we'll do our work on our side also to um, adjust it to make sure we're giving credit for those um, uh, claims as well. Um, but uh, please use that form to, to that section of the form to provide additional information like that. It's very helpful to hear directly from you all. Thank you. I don't see any more questions popping up uh, and I'm gonna take this opportunity to uh, again, thank everyone uh, from Sarah and Lisa to uh, Brooke, who I think is managing some of this in the background. Um, and also uh, Ronnie, we, uh, we can't thank you enough for all your time and expertise in this. And Dr. Savicki, thank you very much for uh, just helping us uh, flesh out this idea and coming up with the, the resources to be able to make this happen. Um, so we're thrilled. I love the questions. Um, if you continue to have questions, shoot them to us. Uh, as we get questions and emails and uh, things like that, we will update the FAQ page uh, that was up. Um, so uh, everybody has access to those questions uh, and the answers that are, are derived. Um, the conversation we had today will be translated into an FAQ as well. Uh, so it'll be posted on the website, but I can't thank y'all enough. I can't thank the practitioners out there enough for doing the hard work. Um, we love working with you all. Uh, we love working with our trainers and our network of trainers. And we do hope that this is a, uh, a long-term commitment uh, to the state of Louisiana to really get better services for kids and families. Any other last words or questions? I think I saw one more question maybe come in. Oh, I, the question actually came to me. That's why I saw it. Now, <laughs> so the question is, uh, uh, somebody missed the funding dollars piece in terms of where this came from. Uh, Dr. Savicki, you want to explain where the money on this one came from? Sure. This is actually from um, one-time um, mental health block grant dollars um, managed by OBH. And this is um, uh, OBH executive teams. Uh, um, efforts to allocate this to really support these providers in, in you know, whatever way we can. Stephen, if I could just 
uh, say thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, we're available for um, any questions. Um, please email our evidence to practice at lsuhsc.edu. We are monitoring daily to get the answers back to you as soon as possible and updating our frequently asked questions page. Yes, thank you. Lisa put our email address in the chat box. And um, uh, I echo Stephen and Dr. Savicki's message that um, it's, a, it's incredible what you all do in the field and your, your contribution to the Medicaid population is essential. And we're um, working to recognize that and, and help you sustain your practice in the Medicaid population. Um, kudos to everyone and thank you for joining today. And I guess that's, uh, we'll adjourn and um, everyone uh, have the, a great rest of your day.